is, is um, I have an example, um, but it's not one that I have to do. So if you have any questions uh, about your assignments or anything, um, maybe we can review them as a, a, a class activity, uh, given that you comprise a huge portion of the class at this point. So anything that is of interest to you is of interest to a high percentage of the class. So um, do you have any questions uh, about uh, well, I, something you're trying to do? I started, started working on the, um, I, I, the uh, exercise that was due Tuesday. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Very, very simple. The uh, working on the time or on the uh, alarm right okay. now. Okay. Uh, and I've, I've got a time picker right now. Mm -hmm. And uh, I just need to review things more. So, okay. Uh, so if you want to go on to something else, that'd be fine too. But mm -hmm. um, there's a couple of things. Uh, one is. And I, and I was just starting to review, because in the example for the chapter, it's not as clear cut, and I found myself having to sift through what I need and what okay. I need. Whereas the examples that you uh, went through in class uh, mm -hmm. on, the, on the thread Threads, on right. Thursday, All right. what's clear. Yeah. So, uh, I, you know, it's up to you. I just need to review that more okay. uh, and, and, and pull what I need from there. The Because um, uh, what I'm going to do, basically, Start up my thread and then, then just uh, compare the current time to what my alarm time is, and as soon as they match, right? You know, I'm good. Yeah, I will. Um, but the I was thinking about your question and other further questions, but and I know there's appendix in the book, but one thing I I am not got a clear understanding of um, is when I need to do a try catch. You know, what specific? Okay. What specific? Uh, you know, is there a list of Things that I'm doing that you know I, I better make sure I've got a try catch here, uh, as opposed to things that uh, you know I really don't necessarily need to put a try catch. Okay, skill, so. that that that's a good question. Uh, the question was raised, and this is almost a bigger question than an Android question. I mean, this is this is a a, a Java question or just really a programming question. Uh, and the question that was raised is, when do you need to do a try or catch? And when do you not not need to do a try or try catch? All right. Um, we'll give, you know, in the spirit of election year, you know, we'll give a very vague answer uh, to it, and I'll probably end up talking about something else instead, you know, uh, China or something. But, uh, but um, the question of when you do a try catch is you do a try catch under under two conditions. Number one whether you've identified something that you're doing is risky. Okay, now we can, we can talk about what constitutes risky uh, in, in a minute here, but essentially anything that has a risk of failing. So, if I had code that looked like this, and again, I'm just going to make some very, sim very simplistic code, but you know, don't, don't take this at face value. If I had code that looked like this, um, a, a function, let's say, public calc sales tax. That's a bad example. All right. Um, you know, this is election year. We not, shouldn't be talking about taxes. If we had a function that said, um, square a number, all right? It's, I know it's a bad example, but we have a public function. Or let's say we have one called cube. And it accepts as an argument an integer and it returns an integer.
we have something like that, return result. What could go wrong inside that function? Nothing. Nothing can go wrong. It's getting an integer, it's multiplying the integer by itself, and it's returning a result. Nothing I can do there is, runs the risk of any problems. All right. Compare that to, say, for example, writing a database or updating a database. There's all kinds of things that could go wrong with that. All right. Um, number one, all right, and let, let's consider some of the things that could go wrong. You know, one thing that could go wrong is that we're going to violate one of the database constraints, either through a bug or through, you know, something. In other words, we're trying to insert a row without a primary key value. That's, that's bad. The database file itself could have somehow got messed up or corrupted or whatever. All right. Any number of things could go bad. So in that case, we're sort of referring to something outside of our program. Even if we're doing a file write, if we're writing to a sequential file, let's say, a file log, that could go wrong because our device could be full. Our SD card could be full and there's no space to write data out there. That's something that relies on something outside of the control of the program. All right. If you think of user input, well, I wouldn't have a try-catch in this code if I accepted from a text box a try-catch, uh, uh, or if I accepted from a text box something, I might want to put a try-catch to make sure that it was numeric and, the, and, and casting it to a string didn't fail. So that's something where the user is doing something that's sort of outside the control of the program. So in general terms, anything that you would define as risky relies on something outside of the program, I guess you would, you would do that. If, for example, I was connecting to some web service, for example, like maybe my application displayed the current weather, all right, and it connected to some web service and, you know, made a request for the weather, got back maybe an XML file that dealt with weather and display that. That's outside of the control of the program. All right? Something could go wrong with that. So it, it, the short answer is you would put a try catch around code that you think something could go wrong on. What defines whether something could go wrong with it? Uh, what something could go wrong with it if, again, it's something outside of your program. You're relying on some sort of outside resource and again, some of the user actions as well. If users could do something that could incorrectly uh, have a bad impact on it, then you would, you would do a try-catch. Now, you can set up custom exceptions of your own, of course. Um, like, for example, I was going to do the calculate sales tax. Or if you remember, we did our uh, tip calculator. You know, we might want to put an exception on that to not allow negative amounts for the for the, uh, for, for the amount of the bill, because then it gives goofy calculations. You know, you'd, you'd try to collect some money off the waiter uh, if you put in a negative amount. So you can define your own exceptions of unusual circumstances that, that again, you want to be able to handle. You want to prevent from happening, and you want to be able to handle. Uh, another way to put it uh, is if there's something you can do about the error. If there's something that you can do about it, you'd want to catch the exception. So if you don't catch the exception, what's going to happen? If there, well, it's going to force close probably the program. You know, it's going to. I don't know if you've ever seen. If you do something really outrageous in your code, um, it'll say application unexpectedly shut down or uh, uh, application force close or, or something like that. So if you did something really really bad in your code, it's going to blow up like that. And it'll be much nicer instead, like if you're trying to connect to some external uh, service, to say, unable to get current weather data, as opposed to having your application crashing. Or they change the format. Or they change, yeah, exactly. Or they, may, maybe they're sending it back as XML, and they send it back in a different format, and you haven't caught up with it yet. All right. So again, the, 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 the vague answer is code that you think is at risk of bombing out. Then we have to identify what makes code 
risk bombing out. And I would say things that rely on stuff outside of the control of the program. So stuff that users do, uh, possibly. Um, stuff that integrates with other services, the web, network, database, any of those sorts of things. So I guess that would be, that would be kind of my answer uh, to that. It's not really uh, a specific answer, but again, you know, you have to consider the case and, and, uh, and consider uh, that. Yeah, That that's that's a good point. You can if there's if there's a class if you're using some other class and you're not sure about what exceptions it throws, you could uh, you could um, look at the Java docs and that should say what exceptions that that class throws. You can always though you can trap for exception and put some sort of generic message up and that would at least keep it from bombing out uh, in an ugly way. Um, and, and for example. Well, you know, if you're using a, a group of classes that relate to something and you're not sure all the exceptions, but you know it's an exception that that class threw, you could give some sort of error message saying in general terms something went wrong with such and such class. So at least you, you have an idea and, and maybe that would give the user some idea of what, even if you weren't trapping for a specific exception. Um, but yeah, I mean beyond that, you know, uh, that'll come with time and, and, and uh, from reviewing the Java docs you can get a sense of what exceptions uh, a given class will, will throw or not. Yeah, because the examples in the book are great, but they don't necessarily, may or may not throw those try catches in where mm -hmm. you might need them all the time because they, they're trying to you know, be concise with the code. Right, sure. I mean, feel free to bring to attention and, and bring uh, to discussion, either either in class or via email or whatever. Like, gee, on page 156, shouldn't there be a try catch around that? And you know, I we can review it and I can come up with with my opinion. Um, yeah, that's a good question, though. I mean, I, I don't know if I have a definitive answer for that, other than. You know, that, that's just something that, that you have to get a sense for and you have to think in terms of what could go wrong with this code and what am I going to do about it if it does go wrong, you know. All right. It seems like you're pretty comfortable on the other, uh, on the other stuff. You know, you have some stuff you have to figure out. So unless you have specific questions, we'll go to my example, which is a different kind of animation. And I do have to confess that I reviewed this example, but um, I didn't view it as thoroughly as I like to. So we'll have an adventure. After we review the basics of it, I'll, I'll then ask you if you want to watch or if you want to do something. All right, because I have, I have a change I want to make in, in this, uh, and we can take a look at it. Or maybe we can work through it together. All right. So here it is. This is a basic sprite animation. Now, are you familiar with sprites, the term sprite in animation? It. Yeah. It, it's... Not, the whole animation is right. Maybe something I'm not, I'm not familiar with. So. Right. Uh, sprites is, is largely like a 2D animation thing. Um, like a lot of the old school video games used, uh, used uh, sprites. And some of them still do today. Right? I mean, it's not exclusively... Uh, something of the past. You know, sprites can be used for animation. And the idea for, for sprite animation is that you can, you, you get a, a image that has maybe a guy on it or, or a woman. And it'll be the woman in different, uh, the guy or the woman um, showing frames of 
some activity. For example, if they're walking, it'll show one where the one foot's ahead, one where the feet are even, one where the other foot's ahead, and so on. It, yeah, go ahead. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. I'm not sure if that sprites, but it would be along those lines. It's definitely 2D graphic. It's not. It's not 3D graphics. Oh, we'll go to the. We'll go to the other computer. But if I go and like Google sprites. We can see Let's look for a Mario sprite sheet. Okay. Probably copyright infringement. I don't know. All right. You can look and let's zoom in so that we can see Mario better. Here's Mario doing certain things. You know, he's turning. The, this section he's turning. Back facing you, front facing you, sort of 45 degrees and so on. Here he is running carrying his broom. Here he is with a hammer It's going to bust someone on the head. All right, and so on. And if you notice, all of these, this sheet actually has a bunch of different little activities on it. All right, and, and each animation is like you to think uh, the animation. It's, it's a character that's moved a little bit. And then what you can do, and the nice thing what you can do with, with this is if you want to show him running, for example. All right, here it looks like he's running and jumping. All right, and then he's landing. You would show that image, then that image, then that image, then that image. And if you show it quick enough, it's like the old flip books you had as a kid. It, it looks like uh, a motion. Let's see if we can find another sprite sheet just for the fun of it. could be done a couple different ways. You know, almost anything can be done a bunch of different ways. All right. Doing activities and so on. All right, and the idea is, is that these in a sequence form some sort of action. Now what happens a lot of times is if you're going to animate these sprites, you can do two things. All right? I want to find a real good one here. A lot. It, it, it depends how you score a different way. 
Uh, one is, one way is through um, XML that we've seen. All right. Uh, and, and in that you can take an image and you can animate it by saying how it's transformed, if it's rotated or whatever. The other is the, the view animation that we did last time with the, the faces flying across the screen. That's another one. We're going to do sort of our own hand-coded animation in this example. But we could also add to this, uh, you can also do frame-by-frame uh, uh, -frame sprites via XML as well. I looked for an example for that and I, I didn't find it. Can you combine the different forms? Yes. Okay. I w yeah. Um, I would say so. Yeah, there there can be like uh, through like a 3D engine for for animation for more elaborate 3D games. All right, there we go. There's Mario doing some things, running, yeah, running and jumping and so on. All right, so now let's look at this guy, and we'll spend a few minutes talking about what we're going to do with them, and then we'll, we'll maybe play with the code a bit. All right, in this example, and I did post a link for it, we have someone walking. All right. Let me zoom in on this person. So we have a person walking. All right, doesn't show up as nice as I like it to, but you can still you can still sort of see it. Yeah, let me let me do that. Let me let me hit the lights. All right, so you can see the person walking, and right now the person's walking in place. In literature, this would be known as foreshadowing, right? Because you can kind of guess what we're gonna want to do with this. All right. Now, what they've done simply as a learning exercise, uh, so simply as a demonstration, is they've put the sprite sheet there. All right. This is just, normally this would be hidden. This is behind the, sh the scenes. And what they're showing you as the one highlights green is that's the current frame. All right. In other words, whatever one gets highlighted green gets placed up here. And it happens so fast that it get, again it gives the illusion that they're that they're walking. So it's not actually a separate file. No, in this case it's not a separate file. So this could be done and again the point is it could be done a couple different ways. You could take in an image editor and carve that image up. All right? But if you look at the image here let's bring up the image. going. Let me zoom in. There's actually five images in the sequence. All right. And if we look at this closely, we'll see that each one of them takes up a fifth of the width of the entire image. All right. So in other words, 
We could go in an image editor and make that image 1, image 2, image 3, image 4, image 5. Then we could use XML to maybe loop through those if we wanted to. But it's just as easy to have our code carve this image on the fly into different things. In other words, if we know what's the width of this image, um, it's 150 wide. So it's 150 pixels wide. And there's five of them. So each of these little images is 30 pixels. So we know that we can slice this into 30 pixel pieces and uh, we can do that programmatically and not actually literally slice the image. And then we can go and then we can use that section of the image to post up to there. All right. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to have a loop that goes from 0 through 5, all right, or 0 through 4. Each time through the loop it's going to grab a new section of the image, copy that, and put it up there. And it will just do that in rapid fire succession. All right. Now the nice thing about this is if you're doing game development, you as a programmer might not be particularly good at generating graphics and, and the sprite. You could have someone do that for you and then you could just, you could just animate them. Yeah, I was just thinking I have to find a friend who's uh, a Right, to, to do the sprites. Well, there's also a lot of stuff online too that makes people yep. care that they just, you know, get stuff yep. And, and Creative Commons and, and so on. Uh, if we look at this, our walking activity uh, is an activity that it has a main game panel, which is this custom view, and really nothing earth shattering here. It makes a new view from the game view, game panel view. Our game panel view actually has several things in it. Um, beyond um, that, we can zoom out of this for a second. Yeah. This also has on it a, a little display displaying the frames per second up there in the corner. Oops. So you see 50 frames per second. All right. So that's what's in the view visible part. You had a question about the code? Yeah, the first three, the activity. Oh, the activity? Yeah. Question on any of that? What that is do is that's making it, if you notice, notice that there's no title bar on this window oh, okay. or anything like that. That's effectively what it's doing. Okay. Alright, so it's making it full screen, no title bar, and all that. Alright. Our main game panel has the walker, who's Elaine. I don't know where Elaine is from. Apparently Elaine is from some, some story or something. Alright. It has a thread, right, because we want to be able to respond to user input. Again, if you think this is a game, you know, if you touch this, something would happen, presumably, if it was a game. So you don't want that animation in the same thread as the UI, right? For, for again, for all the reasons that we gave before. All right, so it has a thread. It has uh, frames per second that it's displaying as a string up in the corner that it formats. All right. It creates Elaine, which is its own class. It fires up the thread, and then it goes from there. There are a couple of methods on this. A render, 
and an update method and a display frames per second. All right. That tells Elaine to draw itself and it tells Elaine to update herself. Okay. Those would be invoked back by the thread. Let's look at the thread. It's a lot of parameters in here that it's keeping track of. I have a feeling this thread was used, is used for other things too. Maybe not in this example, but other things. So it's kind of gathering statistics. One thing it's doing, for example, is if you think about this, you want the person to walk at a steady rate. All right? And therefore, um, how do I want to say? Um, if it's a certain number of frames per second, if this thread would fire up the update more often than that many times per second, you'd, you'd have some issues. All right. So there's things in here that keep it from like firing off uh, and, and seeing if, if, if a frame has been skipped to put them back where they belong and, and all sorts of things with that. So I have a feeling this thread is more robust than it would need to be for this simple demonstration. But I think that they build on this in other examples. The part that I want to look at is we have while running we render and we update this. Then we go to sleep. All right. Render and update, of course, call these methods to display the canvas and to update Elaine. So Elaine gets updated every few, you know, each trip through the thread uh, after the, the delay. Let's look at what Elaine looks at. Elaine has a bunch of properties. Elaine has a bitmap associated with her, which if you remember is the bitmap that contains all five of those, um, all five of those, uh, yeah, it's a PNG that contains all five of those little sprites. All right. So that's the, that's the whole animation sequence is in that one bitmap. The source rectangle is the portion of the big picture that we're going to cut, or not cut really, but copy and make the new drawing up there. So in other words, the source rectangle on our canvas will be The source rectangle on our canvas will be first a rectangle that surrounds this person, this version, this, this part of the image, then this one, then this one, then this one. But it's a rectangle. We're actually going to take uh, and draw on a canvas. Now, we haven't talked about the canvas a lot here, but that's another way you can do graphics and animation. The canvas, think of a canvas as, you know, like a canvas would be in art. And what do you do in art? You can paint on it, right? How do you paint? Well, you can paint by drawing lines on it. You can draw circles on it. Or you can paste a picture on it. You can cut out a rectangle from somewhere and paste that somewhere. And that's effectively what we're going to do. All right. Number of frames in the animation, that will be five. The current frame, that's just a variable that's going to cycle through, zero through four. All right. 
frame ticker, the time of the last frame update, the frame period, the sprite width, the sprite height, all right, and then the coordinates of where this guy is going to live. In other words, the x, y position, which is, you know, some low numbers, right? Because it's there and it stays there. So x is probably a very low number, y is maybe a little bit higher number because it's going from the corner. All right. We initialize some stuff, all right? When we call the constructor on a lane animated up here in our main game panel, we will give using the bitmap factory, we will grab the resource of that walk a lane. We will give then the initial position which is 10 for x, 50 for y. The height and width, it's width of the individual sprite is 30 and it's 47 high, and um, 5 frames per second? It said 50. That, mm -hmm. But anyhow, frames per second and a number of frames in the animation. 5 frames per second probably sounds a little, little closer. All right. So we call the constructor, we set the, the bitmap associated with uh, a lane, the X position, the Y position, the current frame, and so on. Oh, that's the frame period. Oh, no. Frames per second, okay. One thing I don't like about this code, it had me confused because I did something and it didn't work, is they call the argument the same thing as the attribute, if you notice. So, for example, the bitmap argument is called bitmap. The instance variable is also called bitmap. I don't like that. Because I messed up once and forgot to say this dot x and it just changed the value of the argument. It didn't change the value of the instance variable like I wanted it to. But I guess that's that person's style. Yeah. I, I, yeah, right. 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 All right, so we initialize this stuff. Then we have a bunch of gets and sets. All right, when we update this, all right, we go and We increment the current frame. So if we're on frame 0, we go to frame 1. If we've hit the number of frames there are, we cycle back to 0. So that's a cycle. Then we go and we define the left part of the source rectangle as being the current frame times the sprite width. Okay? So in other words, if we are on... We have five of these. The, width, the total width of this is 150. And there's five of them. So this one goes from 0 to 29. This guy's at 30. This guy's at 60. 90 and 120. So for frame 0, the left position is going to be 0 times the width of the sprite, which is 30, or 0. The right position will be just the left position plus 30. So the left part of the rectangle is, I'm sorry, the right part of the rectangle is whatever the left is plus 30. So for sprite 0, 0 to 30. For sprite frame 1, for sprite frame 0, 0 to 30. For 1, it will be 30 to 60, and so on down the line. So that's determining the slice of that big image that you're getting. All right. 
So that's what we really do on the update. All right? That's really what we do with the update is we set that current. We, we take the current frame and we set the rectangle We set its attributes of that rectangle, source rectangle. We set the left and the right portion of it. Now, that's what we do when we update it. When we actually draw it, what do we do? We take the rectangle and we create a new destination rectangle. All right. The de destination rectangle is where we're going to put the results. So the destination rectangle is always going to be this little rectangle here. All right. We're going to point to it. How do we point to it? Well, it's going to be a lanes X and Y. All right. So that's the one corner of it. The other corner of it is going to be x plus the sprite width, and then uh, the other corner will be y plus the sprite height. So essentially, we're pointing to this space on the canvas. All right? We're creating a rectangle that points to that space on the canvas. Canvas draw bitmap is going to take our bitmap and copy the source rectangle to the destination rectangle. Remember, the destination rectangle is always this area up here. All right. The source rectangle floats between the five choices. And you can, again, if you look at the little Shading, the shading indicates the one that's selected. After, after, or I have to remember too is that, that this code is also is not just displaying the animations, it's displaying five images. Exactly. The code is also cycling through that at the same time. Yes, right? correct. <clears throat> in, in fact, we'll see. We'll see where it's doing that in a second. Oops. So, this is the piece that takes our slice from the big image, from the animation sheet, and puts it in our result position. All right. That's the highlighted code. The next line is the line that goes and displays this. This image over here, the image with the five pieces. And then these lines of code essentially just makes a I guess you'd call that green rectangle and cycles it over the piece of the image that's currently being selected. So this code right here is a code that draws that little rectangle there. All right? It has nothing to do with the, the actual cutting. Right. Pasting, right. Yeah, it's just, it's just in sync with it. Right. And notice what they do is they, just like, you know, in, in real life you paint on a canvas, they create a paint object and set the properties of that paint object. All right, the properties are 50, 0, 255, 0. Set A, R, G, B. What do you suppose that's doing? I believe it's setting the color. Okay. Okay. 
it's the last three arguments are the color, right? And that makes sense, right? Because what color is the thing? It's green, right? So, zero, no red, 255 for the green, green full blast, zero for the blue. So that's why it's a green rectangle, not some other color rectangle. What's the 50 mean? What's that first 50? That's the first argument mean. Okay. Uh, it's actually um, it's actually the alpha. All right. And, and alpha is the transparency. So 100% alpha would be um, it would be a solid block of green. 0% uh, would be completely invisible, transparent. So 50 is halfway in between. That's why if you notice as we cycle through you can see the green, but the green doesn't cover that image all the way. If we were to set this to 100, then that green block would cover the image. So remember, here we're just setting the paintbrush. All right? We're not drawing anything with it. We could, be, we could do all kinds of things with this paintbrush, right? Not just, just uh, draw a rectangle. So um, we could draw a circle, we could draw a rectangle, we could draw text. In other words, with this canvas, this up here is drawn using a paintbrush. We'll, we'll go take a look at that in a second. So the, all the paintbrush says is like what you've dipped your paint in it. And in this case, we've dipped our paint in green paint that's half see-through. <laughs> all right. If we were, were to go and change that to 100 then, this would run through and we should get a solid green block. And you can't see it. And I stand corrected. It's still yeah, it is still transparent. Somewhat. Let's see if I missed something. Okay, 20. All right, what it's doing, if we look, is it's saying to draw a rectangle that starts at 20, which is the start of that sprite sheet, go in however the width is, 150, all right? That's the Y, I believe, um, to 20 in that paintbrush. Let's go and let's... Google this. So I sure thought if I made that 100, it would be completely solid. What's going on with the display? Set. I guess. No, no, I did not. Strange issue for this paint. Look at our friend, the Java Docs. And I hope this answers the mystery that we have here. Here's a bunch of things that we can set for this. There's set alpha. Set helper to set color, which that takes A, R, G, B, and constructs the color in. Very useful. The new alpha component. Oh, the alpha, that's right, is, is not up to 100. It's up to 255 as well. Um, you got to remember, I teach like 65 different classes. And in, in HTML, uh, or in CSS3, when you set the opacity, you set the opacity of it with a number that goes from 0 to 100, not from 0 to 255. So, if we make this 255. Every, every, every little. Right. Right. I, you know, I thought it looked different, but 
you know, with my eyes, you know, who knows? Exactly. Just like, you know, everyone put your, your gas tank on the same side of the car. Yeah. Okay, this is still running the old one. All right. And there we go. Our solid green block that goes over the one that's selected. Your eye, yeah. And part of that could be the projector, because if you look, you get less of that effect if you look at the, the actual device. Yeah. All right. So, to review this stuff here, all right, we went over another method for animation. And, and that is writing objects of our own that either, and we could have done this a couple different ways. We could have programmatically changed an image view uh, on the page, or we could grab the image and simply do like we did here, grab the sprite sheet and slice it. If you notice, most of the sprites come in sheets. Like when we did a Google, we saw that. So again, we could, we could possibly use one giant sheet for a lot of different things if we knew the displacement over of the different things. We'd have to do calculations and all that. We could simply by getting rid of this little snippet of code I don't know. Yeah. Yeah, ex yeah, I don't know. And we certainly don't have to show the the we certainly don't have to show the um, whole sheet, right? They just did this for demonstration to show you what it was doing. So we could make the person walk. Yeah. Right. Be walking and you don't see the, yeah, down there. Well, we could do that. Yeah, there's a lot of things we could do. Um, so yeah, we could we could shift to that, and that we could do with we could put an image view behind them, and then shift that over. Do the translate either via XML or via the 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 view animations that we looked at last uh, last time to do that. Right, right. Now, question: How can how do you think? Here, here's a challenge. All right. How do you think we can make them make a walk forward? What do we need to do? Let's think this through. We have to position on canvas. Mm -hmm. We have to my, you know, tra transition that display that image in a, in a progression along the canvas. Okay. So what what attribute of that rectangle that we're going to draw on the canvas do we need to change? Okay, the x coordinate. So let's look at our code here. All right. Where do you think you would want to make that change? You know, excuses, excuses. Where do you think you'd want to make that change? The null's probably the paint brush, and there's probably there, there are the paint object. So the destination Mm -hmm. 
Okay. All right. Yeah, this isn't a constructor. This is a method on this object. All right. And the, the get x simply grabs the x attribute from this guy. And that x attribute gets set in the constructor of a lane. All right. Um, you know, you probably could make it work. But here's what seems reasonable to me. All right, here's what seems reasonable to me. Every time, every time that frame changes, I think I want to increment x. Okay, because every time that frame changes, they've effectively moved forward a little bit. They've gone to the next step in the animation, which the implication is that they're walking forward. They move forward. So that, so that x It's never incremented, right? We would want to throw that rectangle on canvas, those two lines there in the loop. Okay. And with each progression, the X is. Not really. What we want to do is, is if you th think this through, we already have code that updates the frame, that cycles through from frame 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. Wherever we're changing the frame, that's where we want to increment x, right? Because wherever we're changing the frame, they've taken a step forward. So they move forward a little bit. So where do we change the frame? We change the frame in this update method, right? This update method, what it does is it increments the frame by 1, all right? I thought, it was, I thought that was a source frame. Well, yeah, yeah. This, but remember, the source frame, what is the source frame? The source frame is the section of that right. that we're going to put in the destination. Right. So this update sets that source frame. That source frame is used then when we do the draw. So where we increment the source frame is where we want to, I would think, increment the x position. So, Let's look at that. And let's say something like this. Um, Wouldn't it be Yeah, we could do it there. Well, go ahead. I don't want to. Right after we the curve frame? Yeah, we could do it there. We could say set x equals, it probably makes more sense to do it here, set x and um, get x plus 1. All right. Well, let's try it. She's moving, but kind of slow. All right. So let's go and change that to be plus 10. Really, you'd probably want to do some percentage of the screen width, really. You'd, you'd want to do some calculation. But in the interest of time, we can just, we can just wing it. All right. I might be a little too fast. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, well, yeah, yeah, in the airport, right. Let. So let's try five.
all right, that looks pretty good. We could then, when she got off the end of the screen, we could, we could pop her back around or, or whatever. All right. Now, the nice thing is, pardon me? Yeah. Now, the nice thing is, is, um, you know, we could make a bunch of different Elaines, right? Um, if we wanted to have a crowd walking, if we had a street scene and we wanted to animate each one of them individually. Yeah, because we would then have different instances of a lane. And we could give them different X positions, Y positions. We could give them different speeds to walk and all that. We could even, through a little clever uh, image editing, make slightly different versions of a lane so that uh, one Elaine was wearing a red coat and one Elaine was wearing a green coat. We could make maybe a separate sheet. And then almost like they did in the spot on game, where they just effectively flip the coin and says, am I going to make a green spot or a red spot? All right, we could make a red green or an Elaine green, or a, a green Elaine. All right, and we could do that. Or we could have maybe Elaine you know, the Elaine character have a sprite for a, for a man. So you have a mix of that. So really, you just have one, you really, you just have one class, and like you randomize that. In fact, if you look in video games a lot, you know, like if you, if you watch, uh, even, even good video games, you know, even like video games with great graphics, if you look out in the crowd, you'll see the same person over and over and over again, right? Because what do they do? Well, they, uh, you know, they, they, they have three or four people and they just duplicate them 50 times, you know. So we could make a whole slew of Elaine's walking across the screen and by just making little tweaks of changing the sprite sheet that they got it from, we could make Elaine look different, changing some of the other parameters, we could make them walk at different speeds and, and we could have pretty well uh, a nice little crowd scene of people walking around. Now, almost sounds like a good thing for next week. <laughs> I'll have to look to see where we are on the schedule. Uh, I think we, uh, the schedule has caught up with us. So I think next week we will be on the, the chapter that we're supposed to be on, I think. But if we ever uh, get ahead again, that might be something to do where we would animate a whole mess of these, these people going across the screen. Um, then we could add something. Ooh, how about this? I would say, well, I'd have to think this through. But do something that, like, some of the ones, some of the characters that are created may be designated by their costume. Um, if you touch them, you get points. And if you touch the other ones, you don't get points or something like that. You, you, could, you could come up with that. Like the old, like, they, they show, like, a training exercise where they have people pop up and some of them are criminals and some of them are civilians. You could do something along the, uh, those lines. Yeah, right, 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 right. I was thinking Men in Black where they had those things popping up and yeah, the, the, yeah. Uh, but anyhow, all right, any questions? Yeah, this is. This was more, I, I, I knew that Mark was, was going to, was not going to be here. So this is, this is sort of beyond the, the course. Uh, uh, actually, you know, the, 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 yeah, the database example was beyond the course as well, but, but uh, I'm happy to, to bring those things in and, and to go over them because I do think it, it adds a lot to the class. Well, I mean, my, myself personally, I am not uh, familiar with graphics. Mm -hmm. So I don't necessarily have any right. I agree. Um, so, so, you know, that's one of like, like I didn't necessarily want to work on my project tonight because anything that you have to share right. on the line right. is going to open my eyes up. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah, my only reservation is I didn't spend enough time with this example as I wanted to. <laughs> Just do the circumstances beyond my control, but uh, at any rate. So, uh, yeah, I, I, I got enough to get 
the part. I, I, I have to say some of the things in this thread, I'm not 100% sure why it's doing. I did sort of come to the conclusion that the thread is actually part of possibly a bigger project and they might do some other things in that. The, the, some of the functionality built on that thread might be for other stuff beyond this example. What amazes me is it's like it's so, so, I mean, you could do an amazing amount of different things and not have, and your code is very concise. Right. You know, I mean, right. You don't have a necessary huge program right. um, that behind an application. So. Right. Right. Well, it, it does if you think it through. You know, it does if you, if you think through and you plot out the stuff that you're going to do and, and all that. All right. Uh, questions? No, I mean, I'm just, I'm just still, one of, the, one of the things in doing the homework, I'm try, I was trying to sort through what I needed, and what I needed, the whole Canvas, the idea of the Canvas, mm -hmm. so for the, for the, you know, adding the, the uh, clock, mm -hmm. and the time, and the, and the alarm clock part of it, um, I found myself, you know, trying to figure out, do I need a Canvas mm -hmm. or not? Yeah, I wouldn't think yeah. you need. Yeah, I wouldn't think you'd need a canvas. Okay. Because I'm still. I mean, a lot of these terms are new to me, and, and concepts are new. So right. It's just going to have. It's just going to come there. Right. Uh, what's great is that there are so many examples out there. There are. You know, figuring out though from those examples what you need. Like, right. You know, try to catch just like. Right. 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 Yeah, and, and what's tough is, is it seems like there's some examples that just do the very, very simple things that are, are, are simple to the point of being trivial. You know, simple's good, but not if it's trivial. And then there's other examples that are just like so over the top big that they're confusing to look through. So I try to find like the right size examples. You know, examples where there's enough of a challenge where it's doing something interesting and it's not doing just the same old thing. But then again, it's not like, you know, anything earth shattering. I did see a neat example and I forget where it was from. It was from some university, but they did a little planets orbiting the sun thing. And that was kind of a cool animation. Uh, and it was funny, it's like you could tell the person that wrote it was uh, a real um, professor sort of person because they said, well actually the orbits around the sun are actually ellipses, but for simplicity's sake I'm making them circles. It's like, yeah buddy, we forgive you for that, all right? You don't, you don't, have, to, you don't have to make an excuse and say, <laughs> that's why we did it. We know you know your stuff, <laughs> you know. Uh, that's okay to keep it simple for us folks. You know, I, I appreciate these. Right. Yeah. Because, you know, one thing I one thing I've noticed is that the book will give you a lot of different. And I love the book. I'm not mm -hmm. the book at all, but it, uh, it will give you different things in the program. Mm -hmm. And and uh, so like you know, with the assignment, trying to figure out well, I know I need to do right. I need to pull out from this example of the book when I need to do the assignment. Right. Right. No, I I I understand that. The the one thing I don't like about the book is I, I think parts of it it just sort of skimps on, you know, and, and it covers parts of it and then parts it, I don't know if it assumes that you know it already or if, it, or if it, it's saying, well gee, that's not really important to talk about right now. The big example of that is the threading. I, I think I, uh, the threading examples, I think they kind of uh, glossed over that topic. It's kind of like, well, okay, and so you got a thread, but not like, and again, maybe I need to reread it because maybe it just, maybe I just missed it the first pass, but it seemed to me kind of like, well, they probably should go into more details about like why you need that threading and, and that sort of thing. There is a chapter in the appendix. On there is a chapter on the appendix, that's true. Yeah, that, that's true. But um, as far as, and again, maybe they assume that you've covered that first. Um, uh, for that, but yeah, they, they, they kind of more or less just in in my mind where they where they talk about that, they kind of just like, well, okay, you're gonna want to create a thread to do this, and and not really going into details. So yeah, I started reading through the uh, examples that you provide links to on writing. You're right. Yeah, yeah. They'll, you know, they start out more, more simple. Mm -hmm. All right. All righty. All right.
right then. We'll see you next week. You, uh, have you heard of a game called Os Osmo? That sure sounds familiar. Yeah. Basically, like a little cell, mm -hmm. and you try to grow by okay. coming up against cells that are smaller than you. Right. If you hit a cell that's larger than you, you know, it absorbs you. Right, right, right. Smaller than you, you absorb it. Right. Really, pretty cool. There's one I saw, I, I, this is the one I thought you meant at first. That is, again, it's the idea is it's sort of the casual gaming environment, but is one where you combine uh, elements to make things. So you start out like with two elements, and you combine those two, and you come up with a third element. Then you combine that with one of the originals, and you come up with the fourth element, and so on. So like if you have earth and water, you combine that, you make mud. All right. You combine mud with sun and you have adobe bricks, you know, and you just sort of build things just by saying, I want to combine this element with this element. That's, that's kind of a fun game.